I would be ready to give a lot of things that I have if it could help have peace in Palestine. Okay, because I, that's what I am, and I like people like me, and uh, and I, I, I do my little irrelevant things trying to help. I have values. I have values. Um, intellectual values, I have, uh, I have political values, I have, and I know people that have different values. Of course, I don't pretend that uh, you know one of us is as God behind and the other is the devil behind. No, I got to talk with people, with other person, which I do, and and I try to you know get the influence or influence him. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. That's life. We're val- we're f- foundationless, and that's great. Today's guest is one of the world's most renowned physicists. However, somewhat unusually, he's just as fascinated by poetry, art, politics, as he is by science. He's as adept talking about political theory as he is quantum theory. He can talk about Israel-Palestine, but also the history of scientific innovations and discoveries made during the Baghdad Renaissance. He has such an extraordinary range, and I'm so, so happy that we can have this conversation. Carlo Ravelli, welcome to Downstream. Thank you very much for having me. Are we going to talk about some very, I hope you don't mind me saying this, strange, esoteric, complicated things. Before we do that, uh, could you just introduce yourself to the audience as to your own personal introduction to physics? Why are you a physicist? Why are you a scientist? Why are you passionate about the things you write about? Okay, so where do you start from? I came into physics late, um, so I've not been always passionate about science like many of my colleagues. Um, and uh, what fascinated me in physics was uh, not only to understand the world, but to the fact that it gives sort of uh, unusually new perspectives about the world. So it's... Uh, um, discover, unveils things which are beha- beyond what is uh, the, the, the way the, 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 the world usually looks. That part uh, captured me because um, it, in a sense, is more what, 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 it, uh, what it denies about our usual worldview um, that, that attracted me. And also, what attracted me is that it's not just a body of knowledge, it's a, it's, it's a path of discovery. Uh, so it's being in touch with what we do not know. And that uh, was fascinating for me. And what were you studying before science, physics? What did you think as a sort of a child, younger man, did you think that you'd get into? I had an education uh, before going to the university in, in, in high school, which is mostly classical, um, to, to literature, I studied a lot of Latin and Greek philosophy, um, history, art, history, art. A um, little bit of physics, which at the time seemed uh, very boring and incomprehensible to me, very silly. I mean, you say A, you say B, you say C is A times B, and then you get an exercise, compute C, and you just have to multiply A times B. What's the point of this empty game? I couldn't understand it. Um, I was very curious about all sorts of things. Um, in, in, in school and outside school, I was rebellious through, through, through my young years a lot. I talked to myself in all possible ways. One of my ideals of what to be was, was to be a beggar. That was for long, uh, which might sound, um, um, sort of not having a high estimate of yourself. Uh, but my model was Buddha, which is, I think was quite a high model. <laughs> um, and uh, um, then I decided that being beggar was not so nice after all. Um, I just went around with various life plans, all um, more or less unrealizable. For a while I wanted to be a poet. And then I sort of looked at my own poetry and I was clearly not very good. Um, and in the middle of all that, I was studying. In fact, I enrolled into physics at the university and following physics classes quite a lot by elimination of other things. The other thing seems boring. Here, there seemed to be something 
which I didn't know and attractive about how the reality works and ab- about how we think about reality. I would, for me, science was a trying to understand what, it seemed to be a bit magic that uh, this thing we can do, which is science, uh, allows us to, 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 to grasp something uh, new. And uh, this is where, I mean, I grew up in the 60s. The 60s science was uh, very popular in a sense. I was 12 when men get to the moon. So everybody was saying, wow. And uh, the future was fantastic in the 60s. Um, it was a future with uh, robot and all sorts of technology, far, far more wonderful than what people were talking about. Just didn't come. Um, so there was this fascination around. And I was not attracted by technology or by robots, but it was attracted by um, the question whether there was some some wisdom, some knowledge there that I wanted to know. Uh, at the university, when I had to enroll, I, I hesitated all sorts of things. And the last hesitation was between philosophy and physics. And I always say that I chose physics because the line for enrolling was much shorter. You can, you can do that by internet at the time. You had to go in person. So it was a shortened line, and that's why I went to physics. Do you think then that Carlo Rovelli, and, and sorry to speak about you in the third person, but this is really interesting because we're now speaking historically. Do you think that you, as a, as a, as a, as a person, do you think you're, that mindset you're talking about, confluence of poetry, magic, um, uh, a, a belief and a faith in the future, uh, the mysteries of the physical universe, do you think that you were really an expression then of the 1960s and its mindset? And in a way, Carlo Rovelli, young Carlo in the 2020s is far less likely to be that enchanted with the world, enchanted with the possibilities of the future. No, not at all. I think that I'm, I'm a man of the past, <laughs> in a sense. I'm still that person, very much. But that's what I mean. So, so for instance, in the UK, we have, um, I'm sure it's the same in Italy, but there's been historically this binary between arts and sciences. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, this is an age-old binary, but this was talked about in education policy and by civil yeah. servants in this country in a quite unique, special way. Um, and I, I see this affliction um, all the time where parents tell their children, oh, you're artistic, you're creative, you're not analytical and you're not uh, re- repetitively minded, somebody who's like a scientist or an engineer. And, and that, that division of labor to me only seems to be getting stronger and, and worse and more, more ugly over time, frankly, because it's obviously nonsensical. So this idea that, you know, you could do all those things, come to physics late, have that sense of enchantment. Like I, you, you call it a person of the past, so it sort of gets to the heart of what I'm saying is that that couldn't happen now, could it? Could you enroll in a in a physics degree now as a 25 year old and <laughs> do what you've done? Do you think it's 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 got to be much harder now? Exactly for the for, for the reasons you say, the separation has been growing, no doubt. The silly separation, I would say, that you refer to, um, and uh, the way I view young people today are very much under pressure immediately to sort of find the wage and, and uh, um, choose one or the other or choose. Um, uh, I see this as a problem. I see this as a, it's a way of flattening both uh, scientific education and uh, human education. If you, if, you, if you cut half of what we know in educating the, the youth, you get people that just ha- have half of a brain. Mm. And and you not mentioned it, but I think you say it in the book that you are you you you're captured by the mysteries of the physical universe after taking LSD. <laughs> yeah, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I had a period uh, not very long in my life in which I went through some experiences. It was very young. It started very young, um, sixteen, and it had a strong impact on me. Uh, that was before any idea of going into physics. Uh, in fact, before a lot of the development of what I did later, it wasn't before I got political, before uh, uh, many other things. And uh, um, it was wonderful for many reasons. And one is that um, I, I find it an extremely open-minded experience and somehow it sort of uh, got me a sense, okay, so everything I kn- knew and looks could be different. 
uh, even at the basis, even the day of myself or space and time and people and things. Um, and that was a that stayed with me. I mean, the sense of uh, uh, not necessarily taking seriously what I'm, what seems, and what people will tell me. It also gave me a, a lot of um, um, lightness, in a sense. Um, uh, I sort of go back to those moments when I'm difficulty. I've been then growing and changing and doing other stuff. So I remember it's a great experience. So LSD made you a better scientist? I don't know. I mean, it's like, it's, I, I don't recommend people to take LSD to become scientists. I mean, you don't, you know, Baudelaire did fantastic poetry taking opium, but I wouldn't say people take opium so you become Baudelaire. It doesn't work this way. Yeah, and also there's was it um, William Blake and uh, Miskelin, the doors of perception. Am I right? I think I'm right. There's a long, long ago reference. Uh, but this idea of um, mind altering states, opening visitors, new horizons, new possibilities. Uh, that's a, a long motif. People have you know discussed it at great length. What you're saying, though, what you seem to be suggesting, is that it it, it helped lay the foundation for a curiosity which is yeah. deeply empirical. Yeah, I think especially it's, it's a. Uh, uh, Helped uh, line the foundation is, is very good because it did that by taking away foundations, <laughs> by sort of eating up and destroying foundations. That was the best foundations I could find. And you uh, you mentioned politics. You yeah. were involved in the Radio Alice yeah. in the 70s in Bologna. Yeah. Can you explain that a little bit? Your political activism at that time? Um, I went to study in Bologna. So I was a student there. And... Uh, at the time, uh, Bologna was, I would say, peculiar. Um, this was the second half of the 70s, uh, and uh, the sort of long wave uh, that in Europe was beginning of this, at the end of the 60s, 68 in Paris, and everything that happened was continuing. Um, the use was very strongly politicized, but in a variety of ways that went from, you know, strictly. Uh, Leninists all the way to hippies all, all, all the way to uh, people going back to the countryside and living in the countryside. There was a extreme variety of uh, uh, p p people who were looking for a totally radical change of the world, but in, in all sorts of ways, uh, which were all people that in one way or the other recognized themselves as, uh, as um, part of the same thing in spite of the huge differences. Uh, in Bologna, there was a big university. In fact, the big is the oldest university in Europe, uh, and a tradition of university life. So, university itself became very much a an open space uh, for ideas, ideas of all sort. All, all, all sort. Intellectually, there was strong influences from French, um, uh, Guattari, Deleuze, uh, this kind of. Um, um, uh, and and all sort of other things actually, um, and for experiences, ways of life. I mean, it's it was a university life, so in a sense, it was a a little cage, a golden cage. But um, uh, people were living in 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 apartments which were open and shared essentially by uh, by everybody. People were moving around, uh, and these dreams of a world without. Uh, uh, private property, without borders, without families, without uh, was was uh, was widespread, and in this uh, context, uh, there was a growing political uh, tension because Italy was going to the right, and uh, there was some um, uh, that was the end of a, a period of. Uh, strong uh, uh, workers gain and, uh, and 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 the government trying to sh close up the all the sort of movement of Italy towards socialism um so the radio became a little bit the voice of all this radio Alice, in a mar marvelous way the, the 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 logic of the radio was uh, um there is a little apartment in the center of, of uh, there is a group of people talking there, but the door is open and uh, the phone line is open. So um, it was uh, totally open, meaning everybody could call, immediately be put in uh, uh, life and say whatever he or she wanted uh, 
irrespectively of his or her political ideas or whatever. And so it became a, an open space for communication. Remember, there was no internet at the time, no Facebook, nothing like that. But it was, um, and, and, and a larger and a larger community of, of students, essentially, or young people around the student body uh, were recognizing themselves in this, uh, in, in, in the radio. It, many people in Italy have a sort of a magical rem- memory of that, um, of that first free radio. So, so. The way it worked is that, um, there were no no uh, private radios at the time. Um, there was only uh, public radio. Um, in the UK, there was something similar with some radio from an island. I don't remember the details. Um, there were some holes in the regulations. So pirate you could, radio, we called it. Yeah. Pirate radios, exactly. Uh, we, were, we were not exactly pirate because it was a sort of a gray line, gray area uh, legally in which you could technically start to do yeah. um, to do that. Um, I was, uh, this was started by a small group of people, very smart, and uh, seven or eight or nine. I was very close with them. I was living with one of them. In fact, I was in love with another one of them. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I found myself part of this um, of this story. Then the, uh, the thing turned bad because uh, uh, the, po- the power didn't, didn't like any of all that. At all, at all, at all. So the repression became very strong. Um, there were uh, um, attempts by the police to close everything. There was a uh, there was demonstration. There was students killed by police, uh, and finally the radio was killed. Was co- closed by, by by police in a very dramatic a series of events. I wrote a book about that. Oh, what was the book called? Fatti nostri. Oh yes. So this is the book you got in a bit, a bit of trouble for. I, I got a lot of our trouble facts. for that. <laughs> our facts. Us, our yeah. business. Our, yeah. Our, our, yeah. Exactly. So I wrote a book with three f- f- other friends, and uh, the the way it happened is that um, I wrote a book because uh, uh, you know I was just one of the kids going around in this, uh, um, and there were all these uh, meetings, assembly. How do you say it in English? Assembly, assemblies. Yeah. Assemblies. And all sort of uh, written things produced uh, because people were writing in magazines, things, documents, pictures. Uh, and I decided that somebody should collect all that. And so I started bringing together all the, I had a big box, <laughs> essentially. I was considering myself the um, sort of the the memory uh, ministry of, of the movement. The movement, as we were calling it, this is a huge thing, was a uh, I had a strong sense of identity and no political organization, no real political yeah. organization whatsoever, because that was sort of intrinsically anarchic in, uh, in ideology. So I was collecting all these things. At some point, um, a friend of mine said, well, you have all these things. Why don't you publish this? And I said, okay, let's do a book on, uh, about what is going on. And after the radio was closed, the book included all the, the registration, the typing of the of the events. It was, uh, in Italy, we were pretty strong because uh, at some point, uh, after the killing of some students, uh, police tried to block the university entirely, and, and the and, and and the students blocked the university out. So there was almost a war situation for for a little bit in Bologna. I think this is something that probably needs to be conveyed to a, a UK audience in particular, is precisely how bad the situation was in Italy in the late nineteen seventies in terms was, of repression. It was bad. The repression was very very strong. Uh, uh, people will. I, for instance, got in trouble just because I was writing a book. Yeah. Uh, my all my all the places where I was living, including my parents, poor guys, which were very you know low key conservative, kind nice kind of people. Uh, police arrived them at three o'clock in the night and and, and turned all their house upside down. I'm still sorry for them because it's uh, my fault. Um, some friends were were been in jail for quite a while. Mm. Um, Almost all, uh, after a few years, say, "Oh, sorry, you didn't really do anything wrong." I, I, I was, um, I was charged by all sort of things, um, like uh, you know, insult to the flag, uh, insult to the president, uh, uh, all opinion crimes. And uh, police searched me. I decided to escape at some point <laughs> because I didn't want to spend. And uh, uh, when this finally got to the hands of judges, uh, it was all dismissed. But the effort of police to kill all that was very strong. 
and uh, from that a part of the the part of the youth that was more uh, strictly politically sort of revolutionary uh, who, were, who was hoping for, for a radical change in political structure of society and who was thinking wrongly, but we were all sort of thinking something like that, that the, the society was in a sort of pre-revolutionary stage. Uh, that part went into, into uh, what became the Red Brigades in Italy. So there was a big, huge debate because a lot of people were saying, no, that's completely stupid. That people went there, and that uh, uh, had a result that the repression was even stronger. Of course, that gave to the power the, the excuse for uh, for being even more repressive. Do you think that there's um? I mean, obviously there is, but I'd want you to sort of tease this out: the relationship between your radical political commitments and then your commitment to the scientific method, your scientific curiosity. Because again, just just for again for a UK audience, I think it was 1,500 people emigrate from Italy to France under Mitterrand because they're worried about yes. incarceration. Yes. There are tanks in Bologna, I believe, in 1977. There are tanks in Bologna, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, there's photos of students with guns and so on defending themselves. Look, civil war is, uh, you know... Uh, no, civil war is too much. Yeah, you, you, you call it, you'd call it low-level civil warfare. You know, you could play that scenario out multiple times and something very, very bad would happen. Um, so you go from that that sort of political environment, that political context, you immerse yourself in physics. So what's the relationship between those two things? It's strong. There's one uh, uh, sort of lower level uh, connection, which is simply the fact that in the moment of the strong repression, in the moment of the disappointment, in the moment in which we all saw clearly that uh, the world's not going to change and uh, even our lives will not have much space for, 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 for live the way. In that moment, uh, it was, a few years were very dark for that. I just needed something else. And I wanted something else that was neither, you know, the last thing I wanted is to get a job at the bank with a white shirt and a, <laughs> and a, and, and a tie and be there at 7.30 and, uh, and say, yes, sir, uh, do what other people were thinking was right. That was not me. So I was lo looking for something completely different. For uh, And at the same time, I mean, my idea of, uh, of being a beggar had a little bit lost appeal at that point. Um, and... Uh, uh, if I had been creative artist, I probably would have become a creative artist, but I was not. And science is very, it's a wonderful space of freedom in that respect. Because science is a space where you can uh, think with your own mind. If you do physics, dress the way you want, do it when you want, how you want, and follow what you want. So that was the first, uh, um, first reason. So I, I saw... a. a Toward science, a, a, a possible life, which is a which is a, a a path that many intellectuals have followed since since ever. Right? I mean, a lot of people who don't feel comfortable in the society as it is become intellectuals because, <laughs> because that's a space, a possible space. That's one thing. The second thing, much more directly, is that in physics, I found um, the kind of radical thinking and profoundly change changing picture of reality, which is what fascinated me as a kid already 10 years earlier. There's a thing called Planck's principle, which is this idea that scientific revolutions happen one funeral at a time. Is it, is it similar with politics, do you think? I mean, first of all, is that, is that true with regards to science? Do we, do we as a civilization generate new concepts literally as the people that held the old ones die? I know it sounds morbid, but that's it's not my formulation. And do you think it's a similar it's a similar tendency with politics and political change? I don't know, but uh, in science, certainly, uh, it's not that new ideas are not produced. Um, is that uh, sometimes new ideas have a difficulty of of uh, of uh, being accepted because the old guys are still alive, <laughs> keeping the the gates closed. Uh, so. At some point, they disappear, and the young people are already convinced of something else. Which is something I often think about because I'm old; I'm not young. I keep telling myself. Uh, so I always think, "Am I closing the door to young people?" Or <laughs> maybe I am, but that's fine. They will find a way. They will. They don't need me to to go ahead. Um, so yes, I think there is a 
there is a change in idea which is change in generations, but I think there's a change in ideas that go much faster than a change in generation. Even if, you know, fundamental science is slow. I think one of the confusions in modern society is that scientific discovery is fast. It's not fast. We always have this sense. I meet journalists who ask, who ask me, oh, okay, okay, I met you last month. What's new? Oh, come on, what's new? I mean, if you met me 20 years ago, you, you ask me what's new, but from last month, you don't ask me what's new. We don't know. I mean, maybe somebody has an idea, but nobody knows it's good or bad. Do you think our societies, I mean, obviously, because you could say, I wouldn't call you old, I'd say I'm middle-aged, but you've obviously been around. Do you think our You so said I'm middle-aged. I think I'm middle-aged. Come on, I'm old. I'm old uh, man. I hate middle age. How old are you? I wanted to jump from young to old. How, how old I, are you? I, I think I succeeded, so you're don't call me middle You're 70, right? How old are you? Uh, I'm, what am I, 67, 68. I don't know. Like well, that. I don't you're know. the same age as my dad then. I, I'd call him middle age. Maybe, I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm, I'm, I'm too kind to him. Um, do you think that with regards to things like social media and, and whatnot, do you think that this tendency, this, this, like, this disposal to just immediacy and this frantic something new, do you think that means actually as a society, particularly in the West, does it m make us less capable of the big discoveries? This, this idea that, oh, what's new, like last month, rather than I'm going to commit myself to discovering something really big over 10, 20, 30 years? Um, it might be. It might be. Uh, I'm, I'm more worried the fact that the people who try to do to work on big ideas often are under pressure and the society pressure for for producing something, for printing paper, for writing a book fast, for uh, that's certainly uh, an obstacle. If you look back at people who had the great ideas, um, whether in politics, in science, or in arts, uh, they all people who could close the door and take a lot of time to to to, to develop develop them. Um, but you know. Things change, maybe there's a... <laughs> and here's another question. And young people are smart. I, it's much smarter than my generation, no doubt. You think? Oh, yeah. That's a rare thing for an older person to say, right? Often it's like uh, the platitude is that, oh, the youth, uh, they're not as smart, they're not as well-read. I mean, this is a, I'm talking to Jeff Jarvis soon, who's written this book about you know the Gutenberg period, uh, the age of print. You know, And it's a very common trope now in our society. We say, young people can't concentrate before, people can't finish books because of phones, because of social media, but you don't, you don't buy that? No, I don't buy that. First of all, it, it's an illusion because, you know, people with, uh, people with high culture remember their friends, which were in a small, small layer of society, which read a lot of books. And then years later, look at all the youth, and, and of course, their friends read more books. Than, but that's it's a, it's a perspective thing, it's co comparing wrong things. I, I think that... Youth today knows far more things than what we knew. I mean, I was a guy who was spending its time reading and discovering and traveling and willing to learn. Uh, but any of my students know, knows more than me, of course, because he has more access to books. To and um, and then um, how would I put it? In the West, um, kids are uh, afraid of their future in the way. I think this is the largest difference in the way that my generation was not at all. They worry, oh my God, I'm going to get a job, find my place in society. I didn't want to find my place in society. I want to find my place outside society. And, and I never had a problem about um, finding a job and eating, maybe because the economical situation was different. Uh, Italy and the UK were much more poor than today by far. Um, but the, the gradient was going up. Well, now, much more richness, much more wealth, uh, but uh, it's not going up, it's sort of stagnating or whatever. Um, but this sense of fear and worried about the individual future, it's very much limited to the West. If you go mm. to, the, to, the, to the large world, uh, if you go to the Chinese kids or the Indian kids or the Brazilian kids, they're full of energy. The world is there. They're powerful. Even too much. They they think that uh, the, the future is going to be better than the present, which is not what people think in, uh, in, in Europe or in the US or in the UK. UK is 
part of Europe. You're great <laughs> on that. Well, just about. Um, you're you're really great on the history of science. And there's a sort of line which I took yeah. from reading this book. 19th century separate Aristarchus, who speculates speculates that the Earth goes around the sun, and um, and Copernicus. Yeah. 19 centuries. Yeah. What went wrong? Are we going to, you know, what, what, as a society, like you say, um, discovery is slow, but it's not that slow. So I'm trying to think, well, imagine if we had to wait 19 centuries between the big innovations and discoveries we have today and something as, as disruptive as what Copernicus and, and Kepler do. Um, so what goes wrong for a society, for a civilization to have to wait that long between those kinds of discoveries? Because there was a period... Um, and it's not fashionable to put it this way, but I think it's wrong that it's not fashionable because a, there was a period uh, um, in the sort of Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Alexandria, Greece, um, what's now is Turkey, in the in the sort of Greek world, in which um, there was an extraordinary uh, uh, moment of uh, creativity, um, freedom of thinking, rationality, use f fantastic use of mind and uh, uh let me put it this way today all around the world people go to school okay and go to elementary school and we learn things which is uh, which for humankind were hard to learn it's not it took some times half of the things that more two-thirds of the things that are taught at school were invented in three or four cities in the eastern mediterranean in the span of two or three centuries um, geography, grammar, the, 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 the name of the bodies, I mean, the, 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 you name it, the, the astronomy, is all sorts of things. Um, that period was fantastic and was a period characterized by the lack of, um, but by culture, I mean, by accumulated knowledge, but by the lack of a overwhelming power that would control everything which was typical of most societies of most centuries all around the planet. It was China, Roman Empire, or, or European Middle Ages. That, period, that was a window. The window was closed very rapidly by the establishment of two things. Uh, the, the Roman Empire that uh, unified everybody under, and very rapidly the Roman Empire um, Christianized, so chose a specific ideology and everybody had to think under this ideology. And so it went back to the same ideology of the pharaohs or, or, or the or, or the Chinese Empire, which were you know rich societies, with all sort of things happening, but no free thinking. So um, the 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 Christianity basically killed completely uh, all these intellectual productions. And then, sort of a thousand years later, uh, something happened. And uh, once again, uh, in fact, in a very similar political situation, because it, uh, I'm Italian, so I like to emphasize the good productions of Italy, uh, around the you know, uh, 14, 15th century, uh, Italy was all broken in little independent states, rich, uh, where free thinking was, was coming back. Copernicus, you you, 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 you you mentioned is his sort of Polish Krakow. I mean, Poland is a funny notion that moves around in in Europe in different periods. But he studied in uh, in uh, in Bologna in Padova, like me. I'm very proud of that. Um, in the moment in which was Italian Renaissance, rethink everything, change everything, uh, which was not allowed for many centuries. So um, it's not that there were. It's not that there were long centuries of uh, darkness. I would say there was some darkness from this perspective, right? The Middle Ages is not dark at all from other perspective. But from the point of uh, understanding the world uh, and, and, and science, there have been some periods, some, some, some a few centuries here and there in which uh, uh, what humankind has done is, uh, has, has, been, has been very good. And, and one was in antiquity and one is modernity. So would you, okay, so it's a small sample, it's only two. But would you say there's possibly an, um, an inverse correlation between overwhelming political power, empire, and disruptive sort of scientific breakthroughs, innovation? Which is to say that you take away empire, whether that's the Roman Empire or Holy Roman Empire, or maybe even one day the US Empire, if we're being abstract, 
that would perhaps promote the kinds of um largely but not strictly because uh, um what what typically has blocked uh, thinking is not just empire by itself is when the empire goes together with a strict uh, I, I, ideological not all empires have this um uh soviet union was a very centralized power for a while and was an extraordinary explosion of fantastic science uh, russia in the in the 50s and the 60s uh, half of the things that physicists do to, today were, were, were ide- ideas from in, in my in my in my world we have a we, we have a say every time you have an idea just look for russian physicists 40 years ago that already had it. <laughs> so that was a moment of, of, of great creativity. On the other hand, the same Soviet um, had an ideological cap that blocked something in other direction. Biology was devastating the, 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 the ideology because there it was uh, it played a role in the, in the organization of the so- socialist economy and played a horrible role. Um, because biology was killed by by by, so it, it's complicated. This is because of Engels, right? Because the dialectics of nature, is that right? Am I? I think uh, Engels and the, mater- the dialectic materialism. Uh, um, it's uh, it's it was it, it had played a progressive role, I would say. In the in fact, it was one of my main inspiration for for Mach. And. Uh, and the Russians tried to bring together Engels and, and Mach uh, because the idea of dialectic materialism is that uh, precisely um, uh, knowledge is not fixed, it, it evolves. Um, what happens is that uh, that reading of Marxism was not dominant after a while in 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 Russia right it's a, the 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 Bogdanov was criticizing Lenin saying if you don't accept the idea that the theory itself evolves because of change of society you're frozen mm. the society and you're transforming the Soviet Union in something frozen which is going to die which is what happened so uh, you so, said you said Bogdanov yeah science fiction writer the same the yes. same but but talk science fiction yeah, it's the same. Red uh, Mars. What is a uh, yeah? It's uh, oh, I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the first uh, Red Star. It's, uh, That's the, it. Red Star. Yes, oh, it's a great. It's, it's one of my intellectual heroes. His um, um, his science fiction writing is just a small part of his activity. The biggest part of his activity, besides the politics, uh, it's as a philosopher. It's a fantastic philosophy. Who has had had a lot of influence, which is not known explicitly, but it's a, it's an indirect influence on um, Bertalanffy and system theory and a lot of modern system theory thinking. You can be traced to him. He has this idea that uh, um, you can understand everything in terms of uh, um, re- connection, how, how things work together, uh, how, how things are put together. So. Uh, working together and uh, um, collaboration. So you can understand society in these terms and atoms in this term. An atom is, is an electron and protons. Uh, um, and he was doing exactly what he was saying, bringing together uh, Engels and Mach in, in, in a sense. And Mach in, by himself had this enormous influence in modern physics, right? Um, Einstein is a product of Machian philosophy. Because Einstein understand that uh, 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 simultaneity is not defined, because Mach tell him don't take uh, the current knowledge as metaphysics, as established. Take it as hints for understanding something else. And quantum mechanics also was directly influenced by 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 Mach. Heisenberg um, was a friend of Pauli, his greatest friend, and Mach was his um, godfather. So it was. Home story. <laughs> so I was yeah. going to touch on science fiction, but actually, let's probably get to the 
the the heart of of your profession. Oh, that's good science fiction. Well, 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 we talk about that. You said <laughs> Einstein. Like lo lots of young people are raised to think of Einstein as you know the goat, the greatest of all time when it comes to physicists, scientists, yeah. right? Like the Michael Jordan of physics. Yeah, he's for, Michael for, Jordan. Of exactly. For young people, it's, you know, but, and they they hear E M equals M C squared. Blah 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 blah. Yeah. Why is Einstein so important? He's really the best. <laughs> yeah. So what? Yeah. But why is uh, he the goat? Explain to people who aren't really familiar with his work. Look. Uh, He's done two major things, which are called, which are called the same name, relativity and relativity, special relativity and general relativity. And uh, um, one, he did it when he was in his uh, early 20s, 24, 25, and, and the other 10 years later. Um, and uh, the first one has uh, uh, completely changed the way we think about time. He's the one who understood that time is not the same for everybody. So people can, you know, you, you can have your twin brothers and you have different lives. And when, when you meet one is old, one is young. That's possible. And that's true. He has understood something fundamentally about the world, uh, which uh, we thought it was in some way and is different. And 10 years later, he has written this fabulous theory, general relativity, um, which is currently our best understanding of space and time and gravity. And the theory has predicted uh, an incredible list of totally incredible things, which have all turned out to be true, like black holes, like gravitational waves, like the expansion of the universe, like the bending of light, like the, the distortion of time by matter. All things that when people studied the theories, so come on, that cannot be true. And then they, everything came true. So that's his major thing. But next to this, he has a, a stupendous list of other results. So how could I say, for instance, um, the special relativity paper, he sent it in, in, in 2000, uh, sorry, 1905 to the journal in an envelope. In the same envelope, there were two other papers, one of which he got the Nobel Prize. It's not relative, it's something else, okay? And it's the paper in which he understood that light is made by photons. He introduced the idea of photons. So it's a, a little, little chunks of, of things, okay? And then another paper, another, still another one, in which he finally proved that, atom, uh, that matter is, is, a, is, a, is, is, is an atomic structure, that there are atoms and molecules, which at the time nobody... So this is a guy, 25, that sends in a single envelope three papers each one of them could be a Nobel Prize. Each one of them changes the history of physics. So it's out of scale with the next one. Um, and uh, let me add, add one thing. It's the real reason I love Einstein so much. We, 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 we scientists, we physicists love Einstein. Um, I collected, uh, I made a list of all the mistakes he made. And he makes more mistakes than everybody else. So the number of things in his paper which are wrong it's remarkable. Usually, science is not so bad. They don't make all these mistakes. So he makes calculation mistakes, conceptual mistakes. He gets to conclusions which are wrong. He makes detailed arguments to show something, and then it's completely wrong. Many of this, he changes his idea himself. He correct. Many he didn't. So he had this incredible... Inter how is it possible, right? Is how is it possible everybody... Some, some person get all these things right and uh, all these things wrong. And I think the answer is, uh, well, it's obvious because he was trying, right? He, he's in a spectacular intelligent, takes what we know and says, I try this, try this, try this. Try takes this. risks. Yeah, takes risks, takes risks. And is aware that you can throw away things we, we know, like the photons, right? He, he wrote this paper about light being made by little ch chunks of photons. Everybody saying, "Wait, we we know that we know that it's not like that. We know that light is a wave. Uh, that is known. That is known is what kills <laughs> going going ahead. Okay, I mean, why these things happen? Well, because there are spirits around. How you know? Well, that is known. Okay, that's what blocks. He was able to question things to try and to plus. Since you ask me about Einstein, he had a political." side of him, is an engaged side of him. He's the one that in 1914, beginning of the World War I, wrote a manifesto um, saying 
we are stupid if we do that. It just makes no sense at all. Why are we going to kill one another um, on the idea that there's a clash of cultures between French and England and Germany? Um, let's work together for not one against the other one. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful manifesto. Um, few people listened. And, you know, Europe threw itself in these things of the First World War and Second World War, which is 100 million people killed and, uh, and, 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 and the suicide of, 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 of Europe and the UK as, as a central. And, and I think that's what's going on now. Now we are going into the same thing. I mean, we are, we are, we are uh, in a growing conflict conflictuality in the entire world. So I wish there was an Einstein capable of, of screaming. And there are people who are screaming, but maybe like them, nobody's listening. This is something actually I often say to, to people on the right, you know, I'll be scrolling through Instagram and somebody will be saying, all socialists are stupid. You know, they're so dumb. And I say, well, Einstein was a socialist. So, oh, yeah, he was a socialist. so you know, that's kind of a, <laughs> you, might, you might think they're wrong, but they're certainly not dumb. And at which point I'll have people in my reply saying, actually, I'm smarter than Einstein, you know. So, uh -huh. okay. You have to sort of give up at a point. But it's fascinating, isn't it? You know, it's, I always think of not just Einstein, but Charlie Chaplin too. You know, yeah. two of the iconic figures of the first half of the 20th century were socialists who were, you know, absolutely... Um, overt in their political commitments. They weren't being hidden. You don't really see that so much now. But why do you worry? I mean, the, the socialism is winning worldwide. What's that? Socialism is winning worldwide. It's winning now or? Now. Well, not in Europe it's not. I mean, well, it, in Europe it's not, but no. Europe is, is, is marginal, it's peripheral. No, that's true. Uh, but you're, if you're worried, like you say, if, well, let's go back to the idea of socialism is winning. People won't often hear that. Um, uh -huh. If you're worried about a world war, yeah, I am. Then obviously, a lot. yeah, so am I. So a obviously, lot. what matters therefore is West Asia, Europe, North America. Yeah. So that's why I'm worried about we haven't got the figures, particularly in the quote unquote West. Um, obviously, there are people like yourself, but we haven't got that many people who are. Look at Julian Assange. There are so few high, high profile people treating Assange as a cause celebre. What Julian Assange on WikiLeaks does is expose, people gone about the Bucha mass massacre recently in Ukraine. It was precisely crimes and atrocities like that which were being exposed by WikiLeaks. And the man is, is clearly, he's going to stay in jail indefinitely. That's clearly the plan. Um, and yet we have very few people calling that out at sort of an elite level. So I, I do think that the West is, is quite clearly in a very different place to where it was even, you know, 1920s, 1930s. For a bunch of reasons, some good, some bad, but that's a, a quite bad one, I think. What do you think explains that? The lack of kind of the cultural ether. They, they love to do their hashtags and whatnot, but there's not, there's very few people supporting Assange, as one example. Yeah, I'm surprised there are so few people because he's is clearly a champion of the values that everybody says uh, to defend. Um, cl clarity, transparency, truth. Um, what he has done is just tell people things which were true. So I'm, I'm quite astonished that a uh, few people don't just try to support him more strongly. So what do you think he explains that? Uh, explain that because in, this, in the I think uh, in the in, in 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 the West there is a central power which is very very strong uh which is the, the, the central power of, of, of america it's weaker much weaker than before uh but it's still very strong it's capable of suppressing all the all the um, all the voices that disturb it and uh, in a sense precisely because it's losing ground internationally uh it becomes tougher uh internally in in in, in the control the uh, the we we are under the i mean it's comprehensible why people um want to support the american empire right because uh, it has given uh, prosperity to a large chunk of the world so people are attached to the uh, political structure that give give them prosperity um but this big political structure is not as powerful as it was before is becoming weaker and uh, uh, and weaker. It defend itself in all possible ways, including this uh, sort of repressing voices that try to say the truth. I mean, to, to be a big political power, you have to suppress truth from morning to evening. 
Um, but the, what is going on in the world is that in the meanwhile, the rest of the world has progressed economically, has been in astonishing, spectacular politically. I mean, it's uh, um, in China, uh, 40 years ago, the literacy um, was below 5%. Now, China has a literacy which is uh, um, higher than the West. The number, the, the percentage of people with a university degree in China is much higher than UK and US. Okay? The number of engineering uh, in China is much higher than that. And this in parallel to the fact that um, 40 years ago, uh, there was uh, half a billion people which were below the poverty, the, the extreme poverty line of, of the UN. Okay? Now there's less than 0.1% of the population. So it's a, a extreme poverty has been totally eradicated in 30 years from an order of a billion human beings. The West has never been capable of doing that, by far, by far. The West has taken out of extreme poverty Africa, uh, various, various, it's not, it hasn't, but nothing comparable what has been in, happening in Asia. So how effective has been that political system compared to our political system is without, without comparison. And the overall economy, it's going, the West is going down and China is going up. So we're going to go in a moment, and it's obviously going to, and unless there's a big war, unless there's a total catastrophe, which somebody may be looking for that, um, currently, the uh, GDP pro capita in, in China is uh, uh, sort of one fourth, roughly, of the one in the West, say in, in uh, Europe, which country of Europe or, 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 or the US, and, and growing, very much growing, because uh, it, it's, it's, China is very large. It's a big system. A big si a system. You, you, you have production, consumption, you have everything, right? And uh, they, a lot of people are coming out of the middle class. And a lot of people is very, very rapidly economical development. So it's hard to imagine that uh, the GDP per capita wouldn't get to a half, at least, of the American one. In the moment in which China has half GDP per capita as Europe and America, it has twice, because it's four times more people, just basically it made. It says twice the economy of the state. Twice the economy of the state means twice as big an army, twice as big political influence all over the world, twice as big a power. So the world is going to change. This is what is happening in the world. And in this, this is what's happening in the world. And I feel that um, what the West is doing is, uh, oh, no, 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 let's forbid this by having bigger guns. We, we have to dominate because we are good and the other bad, okay? So we have to dominate and so we have bigger guns. And that's my that's a recipe for a catastrophe, it seems to me. Yeah, it's something that really I've thought about a lot because now obviously it's 2023. We can look at the 2010s behind us. You know, we've got the Owl of Minerva, you've got the rearview mirror. And um, China spent the 2010s experiencing extraordinary economic growth. It builds, I think, something like 75% of all the world's high-speed rail infrastructure over the 2010s. What does Europe do over the 2010s? It tries to basically annihilate Greeks... Spaniards, Italians, Portuguese, um, um, and it allows thousands of people to die in the Mediterranean Sea. So, like, if you're looking at serious civilizations, which are trying to address the problems of the 21st century, trying to offer prosperity to to the masses, that seems quite an indictment of Europe when you hold it up against what China's doing. So, wh where do you stand um, on Europe? Is it is it finished? I can tell you what I wish Europe. The role Europe could play, um, which is this: uh, I, I think that we're 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 going to a rough uh, periods. Uh, this climate change is coming, and uh, and and uh, and there is this reequilibration, which is uh, which has to happen somehow. Europe could play a role of uh, um, helping. Uh, managing this in a in a in a gentle way um it seems that that's a choice for europe either the americans don't seem to be 
keep of, of going the gentle way themselves. They seem, for the moment at least, strongly going, and that's totally res- irrespectively whether it's a republic or the democratic. They're doing exactly the same foreign policy. Um, so it seemed to be in the, uh, what Biden says all the time is that the, the US led world order. So we are the boss, in other words. And 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 everybody who doesn't who doesn't follow, we are gonna, you know, use weapons. Uh, America's used the weapons against 60 or 70 uh, countries since, uh, since, since uh, no, no other. So either, so, so the choice of the West is either to go confrontational with the rest of the world or to find rebalancing. It's still leading, so it could lead toward democracy. I mean, after all, the, 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 the catch world is always democracy, democracy, democracy. So if the world can go toward a more democratic uh, international arrangement where China has a voice, India has a voice, Brazil has a voice, Indonesia has a voice, Africa has a voice, and so on, um, there is a decent next century possible. And Europe could, I hope, instead of just following the belligerence of the US, could have its own voice and help mediate between the, the current world power, um, which is the US, and the rest of the world who is sick and tired of this world power. World power. So you mentioned black holes and, yeah. and Einstein's role in predicting they exist. Yeah. What is a black hole? And, and, and what does it do to space and time? Um, a black hole, uh, we know it very well because Einstein theory describe it, describes it very well. Um, what The recent surprise is that it's real. <laughs> it's not just theoretical. It's not just a prediction of the theory which is not verified. It's a prediction of the theory which is actually true. Verified. So we have seen all these black holes in the sky. And a black hole, it's uh, um, uh, usually born with a great concentration of matter, a big star um, that uh, is by its own um, weight, it it's, uh, falls into itself. And that's the point. Uh, produces a hole in space. So space uh, in, in, in Einstein theory is understood not as something uniform, but something you can stretch um, like a rubber uh, sheet. And, uh, and so you can stretch it horrendously and produce a small bottleneck, a small throat, and a huge thing inside. And that's what the black hole is. So the star falls inside and, and, and create this long internal space Closed by a small bottleneck, which is uh, which is a black hole seen from the outside. So for us, from the outside, the black hole is just a little sphere there, very massive, because there's all sort of stuff inside, uh, but small. It's a very it's it's a lot of matter in a small sphere. If you go there and you go in, uh, it's not just matter squeezed. It's a huge extension of space. Um, which is like a very long tube inside. That's what a black hole is. And what happens to time around a black hole? The, or if you go inside a black right, hole? Right, because the distortion is not just uh, uh, space distortion, it's also time distortion. And uh, um, uh, what, uh, once again, it was, it was predicted by Einstein, but now we can measure, is that even here on Earth, if you go a little bit lower, a time goes slower. So if you, if you, if you have different clocks, um, one higher, one lower, uh, the one lower goes slower, okay? Uh, there's less time. So the more you go close to a mass, the less time there is. Um, and uh, a black hole is such concentrated mass in, in, in a small, th- that when you go very, very close, time s- slows down enormously. So if you look from outside, uh, you see everything moving slower and slower and slower. And if you're there, you see the outside going faster and faster and faster. So if you want to jump to the future, you can just go to a starship, get near a black hole, wait a little bit, come back, and you're into the future. And if you want to jump to the future even more dramatically, you can go inside the black hole <laughs> and wait. That's the theory on which I'm working, which is hypothetical. Wait until you are speeded out the future when the black hole transforms itself into a white hole and come out, and then you would come out in the future, not a few years, but maybe billions of years. You bounced out. You bounce this is the out. Sort of analogy, right? Exactly. That's the analogy I use in the book, but I think it's a good analogy. And it's not just the matter that falls in that bounces out. It's just this uh, stretching of space that gets a maximum and then bounces back. 
and the, the coming back is a white hole. So you've seen the film Interstellar with Matthew McConaughey, presumably. Have you seen that? Yes. Yeah. So that's, that film is broadly correct then? Interstellar. Yeah, and that he he, you know, he he has a part which is very correct. In fact, uh, uh, Kip Thorne is a, is a good scientist who's used as a as a as an advisor, scientific advisor for the for the movie, and he has a lot of part which is scientifically correct. In particular, um, the main uh, character has a little daughter. He goes up, he goes goes the black hole, blah, 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 comes down, comes back, uh, and he's a couple of years older. But his little daughter is an old lady at that point. So he goes to the, to the, to the bed of this old, old lady, which was the little daughter he left a few, few years before for him, um, 70 years before for her. And that's precisely, uh, 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 that's, not, that's not Hollywood or science fiction. You mentioned science fiction. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's science. Then Interstellar also has a, sort of fantasy part when he goes into the black hole and from there sends things to the girl. I mean, there's a, there's a bit of real Hollywood there, which but is the, the part the, I didn't like, of course. <laughs> but the realistic part is very realistic. It's very correct. And so if we're saying that time curves and if the, if, if the experience of time is a function of proximity to mass, yeah. proximity to a super dense, heavy mass. Um, time slows down. Time slows down. Now, to the to the lay person out there, they go, "Wow, that's amazing!" It is amazing. Time's yeah. relative. Is time travel possible, or can we only can we only sort of slow down the experience of time? Is it possible to invert time? Yeah, that's the question. Because uh, time travel, uh, it's what we do every day, right? Every day we try and travel. <laughs> we we we're getting to tomorrow. <laughs> that's our life. Is a time travel, um, and time travel to the future. As, as I just said, it's, it's perfectly possible. It's just a, a matter of money. I mean, you just build a starship, go near a black hole, wait a little bit, come back, and you can come back as much as the future as you want. Now, the, the interesting question then is, can you time travel to the past? And that's a much more subtle uh, question because it has to do um, with what do we really mean by past and future. It has to do with... Uh, what makes past different from future? Um, the short answer is that uh, theoretically, yes, but practically, no, in the same sense in which, uh, you know, if I take this glass and I break it, is it possible that, you know, by shaking, it comes back to itself? Yeah, in principle, it's possible, but in practice, it never happens. If, if the glass was only three pieces, yeah, they may jump back to themselves. But if it is a thousand pieces, they will never get back. So it's um, there's a probability issue here. Um, what distinguishes the past from the future is the improbability of reconstructing the past. And that's what makes uh, the kind of traveling back to the future, uh, the tra traveling back to the past um, of the movies, right? Back to the future, remember the movie. Uh, de facto impossible. And the Big Bang. So we talked about the analogy of a bounce from black holes to white holes, which is the title of your brilliant book. I like it. White holes inside the horizon. Nice and short, but hugely informative. Uh, I, I, I enjoy all your work, work, so I won't say that's my favorite, but I think your historical stuff is brilliant uh, too. But you use the analogy of a, of a bounce um, and you use the phrase once in the book of the Big Bang potentially being the Big Bounce. So what does that quite mean? It's a similar story. Namely, um, we have Einstein theory, but uh, we know Einstein theory is not sufficient for describing these things, the Big Bang or the, or the interior of the black hole. It needs something more. We need quantum, quantum theory because quantum theory there becomes important. So the kind of work that I do is to understand how quantum theory affects this Construct, contraction and squeezing of space and time, these distortions. And uh, what quantum theory seems to suggest to us, as far as we understand, is that uh, you know black hole can bounce back and become white hole. And similarly, in a very similar way, the, the questions are almost the same. Um, a contracting universe can bounce and become an expanding universe, which means that maybe when we look back and we have a 
this record so that the, the universe was very compressed, maybe what happened is that there was a universe before that sort of was collapsing into itself and it bounced into the into our universe. So it's not a Big Bang and, 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 and the black hole the same thing, but a similar phenomena. Similar phenomena describe a similar equation and both caused by the sort of quantum pressure uh, that comes from quantum mechanics that forbid for squeezing things too much. And do you have any speculations about a first cause? Because obviously that's been the obsession of Christian scientific thinkers for, for millennia. So I do. Is there an eternal recurrence of the bouncing or is there something which precedes the bouncing? Oh, that. Uh, oh, that we don't know. I don't think. And, yeah, yeah, my speculation about first cause is forget about these silly questions. <laughs> I mean, who, who cares? It's too far away. It's silly, but not silly in so much as you obviously take cause and effect very seriously. So people looking for a first cause, you just think it's a pointless abstraction. You don't do you don't do causes in science. That's that's a that's a misconception. Um, Bertrand Russell has this very clearly. What you do in in physics, um, what you do in physics is uh, uh, find out that there are regularities in the world. So that um, if this happened, then that's happened. Um, but the regularity don't distinguish past from future. So the question, what is the cause, is not a good question. The question is, uh, um, given that what we can say about what happened next, or given that what we can say about what happened before, the notion of cause is more complicated. The notion of cause has nothing to do with fundamental physics. It has to do... Um, with our own uh, um, way of thinking, which we consider ourselves free, with our own agency, okay? If I push this, I cause it to go, okay? So I, in, 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 the, in the flow event of life, I consider myself free, so I can do this or that. If I do this, this happens. So that, I am the cause of this. The ultimate cause is always ourself, or, or another person considered free. Uh, but Nobody's really free. There is a, as you know, Spinoza says, we call ourselves free because we don't know what are our causes. So, what is the process that led to our decision? Freedom is ignorance of ourself, which is fine. That's it's good. We are free because we're ignorant of what we are. So, how do you how do you how do you square that with say somebody like Marx who says um, uh, we make history but not our conditions of our own making, which is to say that. Humans have the freedom to construct society or reconstruct society, obviously within the constraints of people that went before them. We, ha we have freedom. That's the point. We have freedom because uh, um, each time we describe something, we describe some connections, causes, at some level, okay? And, and we ignore all the others. But at that level, we need to use the notion of freedom because we don't know the others. So it's, it's fine. And we need to to use this effectively. So freedom is not a falsity, it's just an approximation <laughs> of what's going on. So what happened in society, uh, what happened here does depend on what I decide to do. Of course, okay, if I decide to move this, yeah, I move it. Um, but what I decide to do has its own story, which is completely out of, under our control. You, you don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening in all my individual, not just in the neurons, but even in, you know, in the fluctuations of molecules of air that can have an effect on that. It's completely out of control. So it's perfectly correct that we use to understanding phenomena, um, even if I have a, you know, I'm tracking with my laptop. Oh, my laptop has decided to turn, you know, to shut it down right now. Am I cheating no in a sense something has happened in, in, in it such that this has happened for me it, it looks like a decision um and i can program laptops so that some decisions are more likely than others and so on and so forth so if i am educator i want kids to be such that maybe society is better tomorrow and so on and so forth you said some interesting things there um and lots of people would find that like quite sketchy. They'd probably find this whole conversation quite sketchy. We're talking about strange, abstract things. And a fashionable theory to try and capture and explain lots of this recently has been the idea that we live in a simulation. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, where I know, do you, it's very fashionable. Yeah, very fashionable, particularly in the US. Uh-huh. So, where where do you sit on this idea that? Is it plausible that we're experiencing a simulation, or is it just completely ridiculous? As far it's as you're completely concerned? ridiculous. <laughs> Why? Pure, pure bullshit. <laughs> in, Why? My, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, look, if suppose we were we were in in a simulation, who is the simulator? How? What is the, his physics? Is uh, and is that a simulation as well? <laughs> it's also simulated by somebody else? What is the ground for us to say is a simulation? I mean, what is the what is the hint we have? It's it's one of these theories like, you know, suppose we were uh uh we've been put on earth by little red dragons living on the hidden side of the moon. Ah, it's a great story. Is it plausible? No. <laughs> well, I suppose it's plausible. It's, not, it's, it's, plausible it? it's plausible in so much as arguments of the existence of God are plausible because we we discern a certain design in the world. Yeah. The inference, therefore, is there is a designer. That's not a new argument. You know, it goes back you know, fifteen hundred years or more. Um, and I suppose for me, this idea of us living in a, a simulation is really a secular version of um, of a bad argument, of a bad cosmological argument yeah. of the existence of God, yeah, for sure. Exactly. But then again, it's also. It's also for people quite absurd if you're saying, how old is the universe? 15 billion years? Yeah. Something like that, right? Yeah. The, the sun, 14. Like 14, 14 yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's a bit crazy if you're saying, well, the universe is 15 billion years, but right now here, you and I are talking here, people are watching this, they're, they're watching it through the transmission of photons, through their eyeball. That's quite strange for them to comprehend. It's, you know, John Paul Sartre would say it's absurd. And you might not think it's a good argument, but it's... Um, it's a plausible argument for us being in a simulation, or, or is it just implausible? No, it's completely implausible. It's just uh, that humans, uh, once in a while, they discover something, they get super excited about, about discover that thing, and then they think that everything is like their very last discovery. We've just invented video games, and so we're so excited uh, that we think that everything is a video game, okay? At the time of of Descartes, whatever uh, it said, just start building machines. So everything is a machine. The universe is a machine. Okay, and then, you know when people started making wars, they say, "Oh, everything is war." I mean, just the last thing that is uh, on your on your attention, you try to generalize to everything. It's so it's a cognitive, completely silly. It's a cognitive bias, is what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, because we've invented computer games. Now we think the world's a simulation. Yeah, we just invented computer. I was in a, in a few years, computer games will become just normal, like books. Oh, in fact, when books were invented, there was a theory: the universe is a book, right? I mean, uh, Galileo, the universe is a book of nature, and uh, it went all the way to 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 to, to Umberto Eco, right? So on and so forth. So, so no, no, no. I'm sure. Few things, I'm sure. One is that we're not in a simulation. <laughs> okay. How about the existence of God? Um, because the point, and this is something. Sorry, this is something I find fascinating with scientists because scientists, by virtue of their profession, their vocation, are skeptics, and yet somebody like a Richard Dawkins has a an entirely conclusive, comprehensive explanation for what happens when a human dies, which seems so at odds for me. With the scientific method, because we we clearly can't empirically observe what happens once one person dies, what happens to the thought process and whatnot, what happens to our quote unquote selves. Where, where do you stand on this? About God or about after death? Well, God, but also the certainty that God doesn't exist, which seems to be the sort of the central pillar of of scientific atheism for people like Dawkins. I'm an atheist, atheist, um, and pretty serenely so, and uh, and, and without any. Um, uh, look, uh, depending on what we mean by certainty, uh, am I sure that there aren't red dragons the other side of the moon? As a scientist, I'm not really 100% sure. Maybe there are red dragons the other side of the moon, and they're very good in hiding when, when one of our... But that's extremely implausible. Now, to me, given my understanding of the world, um, let me separate things. Uh, that there is a, let me break it in pieces, that there is some of my sort of psychological subjective life continuing after death seems equally implausible that red dragons by the side of the moon. 
just see no evidence whatsoever for that, except some cultures that have been dreaming about that. But some cultures have been dreaming about all sorts of things. But God is a slightly more um, subtle thing because uh, um, the notion of God is so vague. So um, about certain notion of gods, a, a personal god who is a creator who you can pray and it changes things because uh, because uh, that sounds to me equally implausible. Okay, but then when you talk to people, they use the expression god to mean such a wide variety of things uh, that some of which uh, it's it's hard to deny. Uh, so. Um, uh, in philosophy, a good example is Spinoza. Spinoza, in his book, talks about his God and his belief in God. And it's it's a very plausible concept that he uses. It's just nothing to do with what most of the people call God. So the God of Spinoza, which is sort of the, the ensemble of existing thing, nature with its own, uh, its own ways, its own uh, um, laws, or whatever you want to call it, that's what for Spinoza is God. And for him, this is also a source of um, uh, not only mystery, but also um, adoration for us. There is a there is a, something sacred about that, which is something that regards ourself. It's here or here, not outside. Because, uh, And when people talk about that, I, I understand what they mean, of course. I feel a sense of reverence toward the universe. I feel a sense of uh, the holiness of the universe. This is it has to do with my own. So when people talk about their own mind and spiritual life, uh, it all makes sense perfectly, of course. You can translate in neural moving, but it's bad translation. Um, and if that terms, when they talk to God, they talk about a lot of very meaningful things. In fact, Usually, what they mean is that there is something meaningful for me. That's what they mean by God. And then, of course, I follow. Okay, so that's why it's a harder um, it's a harder uh, a statement to say I believe in God. I don't believe in God because it's so vague and can go all directions. You, you seem to believe in the divine, and that comes across in the book. I think that the experience that people have when they say the experience is the divine it's a real experience that people have and we can all share uh it seems to me it's nothing to do with the existence of existence of a of, of a personal god it's just a different thing it's something that regards uh what happened in our brain not what happened in a big bang that to do with the big bang the fact of the big bang inspire inspires us a sense of awe and mystery and uh that's completely real. And that's, in fact, is something that I value, not disvalue. So what makes humans valuable? Because uh, you're a humanist. I mean, that seems quite obvious to me. You know, laced throughout this book is Dante Alighieri. Um, you talk about Albrecht Dürer, great reverence you've already mentioned for um, the Enlightenment and the Renaissance. So you're, you're clearly a humanist. You believe in the capacity of humans to understand the world around them and to change it. Um, and yet you don't believe in God. So what would the argument therefore be against, presumably you, you were, you're opposed to post-humanism or transhumanism, this idea that we could augment ourselves and you know this is again quite fashionable, somebody like, you have no problem with that. I, I don't like it. You don't like it? No, I think it's just Californian exaggerations. But that, that seems to me almost like a religious remnant then because you're saying you don't believe in you don't believe in God. You don't believe in the no, creator. No, wait, wait, wait. Depend, depend. You believe in this abstract idea of, of the universe and its, its no, grandness. So why, why can't we just oversee our own evolution and get rid of, oh, of no, humanity? We, we, What's so nice about humanity? We have evolved, but not so much. We're not changing so much. Since we're changing less than what many people in California assume we are changing. And I think society is changing less than what people say. And, and technology, technology is changing less. It's changing more in the 19th century uh, than now. Uh, technology is stagnating, I think, contrary to Elon Musk and company. Now, look, the question, your question was about values. Um, and I think that the, the mistake that uh, 
part of our civilizations made in the past is simply to think that the values have to be granted by something outside us to be valuable, which is a, is a step I don't understand because obviously we have values that don't need something outside to grant them for being valuable for us. For instance, if I'm thirsty, I'm not thirsty because God tells me that my life is worthwhile and then I want water. I'm thirsty because I want water. It's, it's come from inside. It's how I am. I am this thing that wants water. So I'm value carrier. And I'm thirsty. I'm hungry. I want justice. I want love. I want peace on earth. Well, those are abstractions, I right? I want knowledge. I want... Uh, these are all plenty of things. Some are biological, some are cultural, some are shared, some are come with... Uh, some are personal, some... We all share, some we, part of us share, but these values come from inside. You don't have to, you don't have to put outside and say, okay, I value it because something else be, told me to, to value that. I just value it, that's what I am. But a humanist needs a conception of shared humanity. By virtue of believing the idea of humanity, there has to be some essence to humans, which we all share, which means that you can talk about things like human rights, justice, a global community and whatnot. And of course, very easy way of doing that is this that instantiating the idea of natural rights because we're all made by the same creator. And the experience of the last, I think the last hundred years really, is that in the absence of that, things get quite difficult actually. So how do you- Because in the, in the presence of that things, where things were easier? Pardon? In the presence of an external <laughs> something granting, no, things I, were no, no, easier? No, 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 because you believe in, I, and I believe in humanity. I have the exact same critique of say, yeah. transhumanism that you do, but I think, I don't think you've got strong intellectual foundations for that. I don't think we need the foundations. You don't need the foundations. You don't need foundations. It's just a con it's a, it's a convenient it's a convenient myth. It's not convenience is what we are. I want. I would be ready to give a lot of things that I have if it could help have peace in Palestine. Okay, because I, that's what I am, and I'd like people like me, and uh, and I, 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 I do my little irrelevant things trying to help. I have values. I have values. Um, intellectual values, uh, the, uh, political values. Uh, and I know people that have different values. Of course. I don't pretend that, uh, you know, one of us is as God behind and the other is the devil behind. No, I got to talk with people, with other person, which I do. And and I try to, you know, get the influence or influence him. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. That's life. We are, val we are f foundationless. And that's great. See, I, I, I wonder... I wonder, because I think that maybe if you were to think of a single ideology which is the most destructive for humankind, you'd probably say secular ultranationalism. A secular? Ultranationalism. Oh, yeah, that's a pretty bad one. Yeah. Pretty, pretty bad one, right? <laughs> yeah, because so. what you get, I mean, uh, that, that again seems to be implicit in a lot of the stuff you write. So, you know, you're a bit of a, a Nietzschean in, in so much as you place a lot of value in the pre-Socratics and something clearly goes wrong with Christianity, so to speak. Um, in terms of our ability to scientifically inquire in innovative and, and transformational ways, all the way through to Copernicus, Kepler, and whatnot. A lot of things went well with Christianity as well. well huh? Precisely. So this is. I'm not saying that everything went no, no. wrong with Christianity. Yeah, yeah. But from a, from a from the perspective of um, physics, from perspective of knowledge, yeah. it didn't work very well yeah. until people sort <laughs> of yeah. came out of it. But, but this, from other from other point of view, it went pretty well. Yeah, and I think my worry is in a post-religious society. Um, post-faith society. I think the growth of fundamentalism is a t terrifying thing. Yes. And there's a big part of this. But I, my worry is in a post-faith society, the, the idea, the revolutionary idea of the last 2,000 years really uh, is that of, of universalism, universal salvation. And it might seem alien to us that people ever thought otherwise, but they did. And this idea that you get 2,000 years ago, the idea that everybody can be redeemed, everybody can be your brother and sister. You say that in Islam, you say in Christianity. That is then the basis for our inherited ideas of a universal humanity. And my worry is actually, without that foundation, things get very ugly very quickly. That's my really big worry. And going talking about Israel-Palestine, that's exactly what I see is it, ironically, because it's Israel and it's look, Zionist, let's, let's but get, let's secular get, ultranationalism can be incredibly ugly. Yes, let's back, get back to the to the previous story. Um, the planet had two large experiments of two large societies, both very large, uh, both having a, some version of humanism. Um, one was Confucian, Confucianism, 
Okay, it's a very human thing. The idea is that you have your um, just aspect of Confucianism that I don't write, don't like at all. <clears throat> you have your role. You have to respect your role. That's what makes society work. You have to look for harmony. You have to look things working. No external. It's human. Um, at some point, it has been taken down. Now it's getting back to China as a as an ideology. Um, no proselytism, no idea that you have to tell others what they should do, no preaching, nobody preaches Confucianism, it's just the way society organizes itself, foundational, ethical. As a result, um, 40 centuries of Chinese history have not been all nice, <laughs> been all sort of horrors, but far, far, far less belligerent than what happened, has happened around the Mediterranean, okay? And they never went out to conquer the world, the world and to kill everybody else. They never exterminated continents, like all the, all the Americans and... Uh, so I'm not saying one is good, one is bad. They're good. I mean, the, the, the Europeans were very, very much, much better figuring out the cosmos, so much that when they, they went to, to, to China and they said, we got it, the Chinese said, oh yeah, yeah, you got it, right. But you see, this is, this is what civilization is about. This conversation, this exchange, you got it, wow, fantastic. And everybody now believes in Western understanding of the cosmos in China, okay? But no doubt that the ethical foundation of society, I don't like Confucianism. If I was Chinese, I, was a, I would be a Taoist probably because I'm an anarchist in my soul. But that foundation, completely uh, human and accepting uh, that the values come from within and not not from without. Uh, it worked better. I mean, the 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 uh, the Muslim or, or or Catholic or Christian idea that you know we are the ones that detains <laughs> um, truth and therefore we can uh, go around and do the crusade and exterminate the Mexicans and South Americans, uh, and which is the same. Uh, underlying ideology of the American empire right now. now. I've been living 10 years in America. The Amer Americans are all convinced, profoundly convinced, that uh, it's the superiority of their civilization that legitimizes them to, ru to rule the world because everybody else is barbarian. They, they really think so. I mean, it's, it's, uh, including my good friends who are communist in New York, Jewish communist in New York, but deep themselves, they think, yeah, but you know, this is, um, only the American versions of that is, uh, is a good one. Why? Because this idea that since there is a foundation, which is the truth one, the right one, uh, we are the de depository of the truth. I think we are the depository of the truth is the worst idea of all for, for living together. I have my own truth. I have plenty of things I believe. I'm here, you know, arguing for them and trying to convince you or whatever, whoever is listening to us, uh, uh, not to convince, to throw them and, and, and say, look, come to these ideas. But I listen to others and I, maybe my ideas are wrong. Of course they're wrong. And it's this conversation that I think is, is, is worthwhile. And this is, the, this is the ethic that I prefer. Carlo Ravelli? Great place to finish. It's been delightful talking to you. Thank you very much.